Thank you for inviting me. I'm really um, excited to get to the Q&A session as well, because I always think that's when um, the most interesting conversations come up. So I also have a brief presentation. I'll, I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit today about Syria and Lebanon. Um, Lebanon's kind of an outlier. It hasn't had an uprising. It's not going to have an uprising. But still, I think it's an important conversation uh, to have in light of the question uh, which is what's at stake in the Middle East. A lot is at stake in the Middle East. And um, there are many parts of the Middle East, and what's happening in Lebanon and Syria, I mean, needs to be addressed, I think. Um, so, thinking about Syria, I mean, it's very difficult to think about Syria, and I don't mean that lightly. Um, over the third of the population has been displaced internally and externally. Over 100,000 killed and hundreds of thousands wounded and maimed. Atrocities committed by and against all sides. Cities and villages and refugee camps largely destroyed. Starvation and disease sweeping already vulnerable lives. It is disturbing and actually very unsettling to... <laughs> to actually, I think, think about these things and not just to actually pause on what these numbers say. And what these numbers really are speaking of is the fragility and cheapness of human life. In the United States, the relentless dehumanization of Syria and Syrians in the war on terror, and remember, right, Syria was one of the axis of evil, was an axis. Um, the dehumanization of Syria and the war on terror, I think, has contributed in some ways to the fact that we all were hearing about Syria when it was a question of, are we going to bomb them? Are we going to intervene there? And now, and then once that conversation is over, we don't really seem to hear anything about Syria. Um, and I think, you know, we might, we might have this conversation uh, again sooner or rather than later about intervention with certain things we heard. We had a great event at NYU on Friday about intervention. Um, so for much of the Arab world, if in the United States it's a question of whether we are going to bomb them, or when we're going to bomb them, or how much, how little, where, when. Um, in the Arab world, I think in much of the Arab world, thinking about Syria really brings up different emotions. Um, and these emotions are guilt, paralysis, anger, and a foreboding sense of deja vu. After all, this is a region where civil wars and violence are always already there. And you can think Algeria, Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, where refugees and displacement have shaped the realities of countless nations and nation states. And here, Palestine, Armenians, Iraqis, Yemenis, and more. Lebanese could be added to that list. And most recently, the past three years of the uprisings and authoritarian military re-entrenchment across the region have inspired, numbed, and activated and disillusioned millions across the Arab world. Now, I think the big picture of Syria, the big view of Syria, the big picture view is a little suffocating. And it's really easy to get lost within it. And the big picture really is sort of all those numbers that I was rattling off where to talk about Syria just becomes almost like a horror show. Like it's a repetition of these statistics, of these horrible statistics. But behind the statistics, the political speeches and all the op-eds, there are millions of families, some of them we saw it in this uh, very powerful and incredibly depressing film. Uh, millions of families that would never be the same, individuals who will never return to what was called their home, partly because their homes no longer exist. Children for whom displacement and violence is their everyday life. Now faced with the sort of paralysis about thinking on this sort of microcosmal level about loss and violence, I think it's probably easier to abstract, to make bold pronouncements and judgments. This is going to happen. This is what I think, you know, in two years, the Syrian regime will come. I mean, I'm not going to make these kind of pronouncements today, although they're very seductive. It's seductive to make these big claims. Um, and, but I think the catastrophe of Syria, and I mean the Nakba of Syria here, should not only be that maybe mediated through these sort of overwhelming spectacles, dryly related statistics or grandiose statements. And this is something we struggle a little bit with Andre Dalia, um, and I'm happy to talk about that with the Q&A. It should be mediated and represented in the most quotidian way, precisely because the destruction of Syria is occurring at the level of the everyday. 
and at the atomic level of what makes life livable and less livable. War in Syria is destruction of world heritage sites and the controversies of chemical warfare, but it is also the destruction of one small apartment that housed one small family in Yarmouk or Homs, fields that are no longer being planted and villages that are now empty. People drowned looking for safety across an ocean to Australia. I mean, that's part of what's happening in Syria as well, when refugees are trying to get to Australia over an ocean and, and sink and die. And we could extend to that, of course, also um, immigration into the United States. We could consider that also part of, of war or the way that war is being lived. From destroyed water supplies and gasping soil laced with ore chemicals to city blocks reduced to rubble and roads that no longer lead anywhere, war in Syria is what anthropologists and some sociologists like to call a total social fact. Now, nowhere is it more difficult to think about Syria and to really consider the sort of the enormity of what's happening in Syria than in Lebanon, except maybe Palestine. I think it's also very, it's a very fraught um, conversation to have. Since the Syrian uprising began more than three years ago, friendships, families, and alliances have been fractured, mended, and fractured all over again over the question of Syria. So it's clear like Lebanon is a country, it's a very small country, it's like four million citizens, so it's like a part of New York, like a quarter of New York City, um, or a quarter of Cairo, to that, to that effect. And it's surrounded, I mean, the, the, there are only two borders. So Lebanon only has two borders. One is Syria, one is Lebanon, one is Israel. So obviously, Lebanon has been in a state of war with Israel since 1948. So the only land border that Lebanon has is with Syria. So whatever, that's why the two countries have had a very sort of largely symbiotic historical relationship, even from the genesis of the nation state itself, which was in itself a partition of historical Syria into different states. Now, Lebanese are currently fighting in all sides of the conflict in Lebanon, in Syria. Um, and families, I mean, people are really fractured. Kinship ties are fractured. Trade lines have been fractured. Smuggling is happening across the border, and it always has. I mean, people talk about the Lebanon-Syria border as if, like, now all of a sudden smuggling is happening. I mean, people live through smuggling. Smuggling is a way that people live and cope with the inequalities of life, and it's they're constitutive parts of all borders. It's just that now, what is being trafficked across these borders, in addition to olive oil, fish, vegetables, are, are guns, right? Guns and fighters are going across these borders. But this is not the first time either. I mean, this border has been turned into this kind of uh, war route throughout the Lebanese Civil War and throughout the 2006 war with Israel. I mean, this is a border that in part is constructed through violence and having to deal with violence. Over a million Syrian refugees are in Lebanon currently, seeking safety and survival, which is really a reversal for Lebanon, because Lebanon, I think, has, been, has become uh, quite used to exporting their war refugees to Syria. So this is sort of the first time that there's a really large influx of Syrian refugees, and they're being met with a lot of sort of xenophobia and uh, classism and all of this sort of we can talk about that too. And they're, they're joining, obviously, um, over 450,000 Palestinian refugees, permanent refugees, we could call them in Lebanon, over 100,000 Kurdish refugees. I mean, and this, if you add these numbers up, you say 1 million Syrians, 450,000 Palestinians, 100,000 Kurds, and, you, and I think it's 80,000 Iraqis from the Iraq war. And then you think, okay, but the actual population that has the documentation is 4 million you can really start to see how whatever is happening will continue to affect the social fabric, the economic fabric, the political fabric for the very long term, no matter what, you know, if the war ends tomorrow or after tomorrow. Now, bombings, assassinations, and counter-bombings and assassinations linked to the war in Syria have also rocked Lebanon, a country that is already in a state of perpetual violence and has been in perpetual violence since 2005. For Syrians, Lebanese, and the hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, there is no safety to be had to, in Lebanon. Now, I'm gonna sort of illustrate what I mean by a total so social fact by, sort of, by a very short story. 
please bear with me. Uh, last, last summer, my sister and I were in Beirut, and I was looking for abayas. Abayas are just like a night dress that people wear, men and women, in uh, the Middle East. And I knew exactly what I wanted. I was buying these abayas. I know, just bear with me. I've been buying these abayas in Damascus for 10 to 12 years. Every summer I would go, and so I knew what I wanted. I went around all over Beirut, didn't find anything. Obviously, we couldn't go to Syria, which in itself is very odd to be in Lebanon and not able to go to Syria. It really feels like a sort of quarantine because the other border, you just forget about it. You can't go there. So the only place you, I mean, it just it feels like a quarantine. So we were going around these stores. Finally, we find a store that has these abayas and I'm chatting with the saleswoman and I'm telling her what I want. And she's like, oh, okay, you want a Syrian abaya? I said, yeah, that's what I want. She was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm from Damascus. My family has like a shop in the souk in, of old Damascus. And she started explaining to me how a lot of these small shop owners had tried to move their industries to Lebanon. Um, and most of them had to close, obviously, because of the different, the way, I mean, she made it, she was sort of joking with me. She was like, you guys don't have any cotton. There's no cotton in Lebanon, so how are we gonna make our goods? We all have to close. Um, but she said to me, look, you want a Syrian abaya, but there's no Syria. So how are you going to get your abaya? There's no more Syria. And I don't, I mean, in that moment, I felt so stupid. Like such a privileged idiot. Like here I am looking for a piece of clothing that the whole national industry is gone because the nation and the state and everything that makes possible that one piece of clothing is gone. Um, and I think about that moment every time I'm sort of asked to give the expert opinion on the Middle East, or what's happening, Lebanon and Syria, I think about that little moment and it really sort of, I, it, it's, I use it as an irritant against myself, right? So that I don't get caught up in this way like, oh, this is the big picture, this is what's going to happen, the war will end in this way, this is what the political solution will look like. I think it's really important to really deal with the ways and the multiple ways that violence has destroyed the fab like different fabrics of society. Now, Lebanon, for its side, is broken politically, economically, and socially. In addition to the violence that daily targets civilians for living in areas that are said to belong to this or that political faction, which is always a sectarian faction, religious and sectarian hatred is on the rise. More and more people are pushed into poverty and unemployment. Citizens, refugees, and migrant laborers freeze to death or are crushed to death in the streets, tents, and unsound building. There is no legitimate Lebanese government because of an illegal <coughs> political extension of the elections, which has never happened. Even during the 15 year civil war, we, there was never a delay of elections, and it happened this year for the first time. And finally, after 329 days of this false election, a cabinet was formed after months and months of trying to come up with a cabinet. And presidential elections are supposed to happen this summer. And everybody's sort of watching this as, I mean, people are very nervous right now. They're really waiting for this moment of election. But there is a popular analysis that all, that, all of what I've just said, all that what's happening in Lebanon, can be explained through the metaphor of spillover. So you hear about this in the news a lot, like, oh, like there's the Syrian spillover into Lebanon, the Syrian war is now in Lebanon. I mean, Lebanon has been at war on and off for a very long time. Actually, since the state was created. I mean, if you wanted to be technical about sketching out histories of war, but certainly, <coughs> certainly, certainly you could say that Lebanon has been experiencing deep civil strife and deep civil violence prior to the uprising, prior to the uprising of Syria. <clears throat> Sunni Shia sectarianism and violence has been on the rise in the region since the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq, due to both the occupation forces' incompetence and their design. If anything, I think when we think about Syria, we really have to think about Iraq. And the, and the uh, enticement is always to think about Syria and Lebanon as if they're like this black box. Maybe you hear a little bit about Turkey and the border. Maybe you hear a little bit about refugees in Jordan. But what you don't hear at all is in Iraq. And Syria shares a very long border with Iraq. And what's been happening in Iraq over the last 10 years, not only violence, but the institutionalization of Shia Sunni sectarianism plays a big role in what's happening in Syria today. 
And of course, I mean, whenever there's a war or a civil war, you always have to ask the first question is, where are the guns coming from? Well, the guns are coming from Iraq in, and Turkey and all these places, but oftentimes we think about arms smuggling as sort of happening with states, like, oh, the Turkish government is giving these, is giving these arms to this faction or whatever. But we never hear about Iraq, and I think we really have to, every time we think here in Syria, we have to insist on talking about Iraq because only then can we really expand the political frame and really understand that, in fact, we've been involved in this region as the United States for a very long time. It's not a question of whether the United States is going to intervene or not in Syria. The United States is in Syria, it's in Lebanon, it's in Egypt. It's been there for a very long time. Just because uh, what intervention looks like is a bomb dropping, and then we can say, oh, the United States is involved. The United States is involved, has been involved for decades. I know, time is up. Um, so, there is a war on terror lexicon that operates in Lebanon today, one that is peppered with binaries that we should find very familiar. Things like progressive, oppressive, culture of life, culture of death, Islamist, secular, rational, irrational, tolerant, intolerant, pro-women, anti-women. And these things always map onto each other as if they're these stack of binaries. And that, in some ways, is really the grammar of the war on terror. And although we might not hear about the war on terror very much in the United States anymore, it is very much alive and well um, in the Middle East. Even the cast of characters is similar. Iran and their Lebanese allies are in one corner. Saudi Arabia and their Lebanese allies are in the other corner. Al-Qaeda's seem, and I said plural, Al-Qaeda's seemingly appear from thin air, and everyone seems to oppose them, but they always have money and they always have funds. The United States, complicity in this sort of inferno does not begin with the invasion of Iraq, but it certainly crystallizes there. I really don't think we can understand Lebanon or Syria without thinking about Iraq. Now, there will be no revolution in Lebanon. There will be no uprising. There will be no sweeping away of the political classes. Instead, there is already a civil war. It doesn't look like the war of 1975 to 1990 or of 1958, but this is a civil war. And I think part of the difficulty in recognizing this is, is really sort of a deeply historical relationship to violence that is always spectacular in Syria and Lebanon. So even if you're from the position of Lebanon today looking at Syria, you can't really think that Lebanon is at war because it could, cause look at Syria. Like, we are the place of stability if you look at Syria. Um, and in large part, Lebanon, Lebanese do this within their own history. Like, no, this is not a war because we know what civil war is. And this sort of desensitization to violence that's inherited generationally in many ways um, only contributes to this idea that we're like, there's no war in Lebanon. Everything that's happening in Lebanon today can be explained through this sort of metaphor of spillover. If things in Syria were fine, things in Lebanon would be fine. I mean, it's all, these are all false statements. This is a war, and it will continue as long as Syria burns, and perhaps even after that. I will end on that very positive note. Um, happy and... Geographic. I kept like waiting for like the Shia hexagon, you know. 
I mean, it's, it's really sort of absurd. And I think that these are just frames that, that are supposed to make it easy to understand. But it's really sort of knowledge as consumption. Because these, they make them, they made them seem in the news at least since 2003, which is the year after I moved to the United States. Um, like these hermetically sealed, like almost as if they're different species of people or different groups of people. And obviously I mean, it's crap, it's not true. Um, I mean, and I think the way that people speak about Sunnis and Shias in the United States and in the U.S. news is actually similar to, it's, it follows the same logic of people after September 11th reading the Qur'an, as if the answers, they would find the answers to September 11th in the Qur'an, and you know, after September 11th, the Qur'an was like the number one selling book in the United States for a long time, because people, I mean, and it's the same logic where people speak about Sunnis and Shias as if they are um, and always have been different. And it's actually kind of a racist way, I think, of looking at politics. So Arabs can't have politics. I remember hearing Azmib Shara, um, who is a Palestinian um, politician and activist, speaking about this once. And he was like, yeah, you know, Arabs can't have politics. We're either Sunni or Shia or Christian. That's as far as our politics go, apparently. We can't be communists. We can't be, um, you know, whatever, Democrats, we can't be Republicans, we can't be, you know, liberals. We're either only Sunni Shia or Christian. Um, and that's before we get into, in a place like Lebanon, all, all the plural Christians, all the different Christians. Um, so the question was, like, how true is this? I mean, it's not true. It's become more true. And this, with legalization, with... Um, Legalization, I mean things like Iraq, where the government was set up, strangely enough, on a Lebanese model, as if that model was a good model to begin with, uh, where the government was actually set up to, where the only political categories that mattered were the sectarian categories. And then laws were rewritten in order to uh, make these differences structural. This is not to say that sectarianism doesn't exist and it hasn't existed historically, and that, um, there are, but we should all, I mean, something happens when things become legal. We know that, right? Legal codes have an effect. It's like as if in the United States, if we suddenly said, okay, Catholics are one legal community, Protestants are another. And then a man, like, extrapolate 10 years on from there, um, which is what happened in Iraq. I, I mean, I was in Baghdad in 2003, and, uh, I was there making a movie, and the, uh, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life was a communist, um, and you know, the communist party in Iraq had been illegal for decades and decades and decades and suffered horrible repression at the hands of Saddam, back when Saddam was the American's friend, and it was the Cold War, and the communist party was bad, so we supported them, Saddam, to get rid of the communists. And I was there for sort of the first huge public demonstration of the ICP, the Iraqi Communist Party, in 2003. It was right after the coalition, coalition, what was it? coalition? Provisional. provisional authority had been announced, which was like a council of 13. And we're there, and it was this beautiful moment, and there were thousands of people there in Baghdad, and, uh, and I was saying, oh, you know, so that's great, like there's somebody from the ICP who was on the provisional, who was on that, like, 13 list of people. And the person next to me was like, yeah, but he's there because he's Shia. He's not there as a communist. He's there as a Shia. He's a Shia representative. He's not a communist representative. Because that's the way the structure had been put in place. And I think oftentimes when we imagine Sunni-Shia difference, and there are differences, there are historical grievances, these things are all there, but we imagine them to be these hermetically sealed differences. And we forget about the structures that have produced in many ways, these differences. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I guess we'll run the floor now. Does anyone have any questions? I guess we'll go right you, and then you'll see God you. Yes, uh, my name is Tom Cox. Uh, I wonder if anybody could say anything on possible American and Israeli involvement in the overthrow of the Morrison government. Can I just ask I think that it's, 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 it's going to be one of the ways that the, the just to illustrate or to give an example of what Zach was saying, is if you look at Qatar, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Egypt. I mean, my friend had the best joke after the Marseille was overthrown. He was like, well, 
sorry, he was like, oh, Qatar wants a refund. <laughs> right? And that was partly, I mean, what happened in Egypt was in part one of the, the ways that the relationship between the United States and uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar was reconfigured in many ways. Um, and it's tempting, I think, to, to imagine that the United States is, is, is powerful in that way, but the reality is in the region there are many centers of power. Um, in Lebanon, for example, I mean, the powers that, that we worry about every day are more of the, what's happening between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That's probably the biggest concern. But the ways in this is that these sort of frayed relationships are playing out is, I mean, for, like Saudi Arabia, I think, four months ago gave the Lebanese army $3 billion to, to arm itself, which is very strange because the Lebanese army is pathetic. But anyway, and the only condition was they cannot buy American arms. They have to buy French arms. The reason is that Saudi Arabia and France are closer on the issue of Syria than they are to the United States. So these are some of the ways that these relationships are reworking, and it was really like a thumb in the, what is the expression? Thumb in the face, thumb in the eye, thumb in the eye. It was really a thumb, it was meant to be a demonstration of this thumb in the eye to the United States. Like, yes, we'll give you $3 billion, but no, you can't buy anything American with it. It has to be French. Well, the Saudis would say, that's our job, we buy from the U.S. <laughs> Although, even, I mean, this was the issue, right, is that the Saudis are actually going to shift their military contracts to yeah. France and England, and this was a big concern for the United States. This is one of the most prolific, one of the only industries that's always been doing very well for itself in the United States, so it was a big problem. Okay, so do we have another question? I guess we'll take two um, and try to answer both two at once. Does anyone else have a question? Go ahead, you can ask a question. Yep, you can. Um, it's hard for me to believe that when the United States occupied Iraq, they would allow that. I mean, and you had a person on the Iraqi government council, or am I talking about the wrong country? Did I miss <laughs> something, or? No, no, what I was saying is that the Iraqi Communist Party, okay, was really, uh, was made illegal and was really driven on the ground under the Saddam regime. After 2003, after the invasion, they did, they did present themselves more, but even somebody who was a member of the Iraqi Communist Party, when he was put on government, it was only in his capacity as a Shia. Right, I understand that. Well, I, I just, um, I know Henry Kissinger is in charge of suppressing all dissent in Iraq. I, I just, I, I'm just astonished that the Iraqi communists or socialists would be legal now, you know. But you're saying they are, are uh, they, they still a legal they, party? Is, Can they? As long as the Soviet Union isn't behind it, I don't think it matters. And not that there's no Soviet Union, you can have an ICP. Okay. Okay. So, I, and Maya, recently I think you wrote an article in which you discussed gender discrimination and violence uh, against women um, and, how, and it, how it was playing out in Lebanon and, and how it intersected with nationalism and uh, immigrant refugees. And I'm just wondering if you can give an example of that and, and, and say whether that's happening in other places as well. Um, but I think broadly speaking, there has been a lot of, uh, there have been certain ways that gender is discussed when it comes to the Arab uprisings over the past three years. And I can't believe it's been three years actually, but it has been three years. Um, and I think that there are really some dominant ways that sexual and bodily rights have been framed and gendered in this three-year period. The first one is sort of the equation of gender with women or, or sexual minorities as if men aren't gendered. So you hear a gendered analysis only coming in when it happens to be somebody with a, who's a woman or somebody who's gay, but you never hear a gendered analysis coming in when you're talking about men which is obviously a problem because men are gendered as well. And if we've learned anything from the war on terror, it's that the Arab man, the Arab Muslim man, is a highly gendered category. Um, two is the way that gender and sex panics, which is, I think the article that you're referring to, is linked to a fear of Islamists, and that this sort of functions as like a secular alibi 
So seculars are always going to be better to their women and their gays than the Islamists are. That's sort of the logic, the logic that gets played out. Um, and third is the use of gender and sex violence politically in order to dissuade protests or, um, you know, in order to um, denounce the legitimacy of certain protests, which happened in Bahrain and Yemen, where the protests, the president would go up and say, oh, the protests are this place where this impure mixing is happening between men and women, and that becomes then a way to discredit the protests. Um, but you know, I mean, we shouldn't be too. And then, I mean, within this, something that I'm that I that interests me a great deal is actually the way that we think about political violence itself. And it seems as if um, discursively there's a separation done between sexual violence and political violence, where the sexual violence is what's happening to women, for example, in a refugee camp, or the sexual violence are what's happening when a Syrian uh, regime member, let's say, rapes somebody after they take over. Uh, so that's sexual violence. And then political violence is what happens when men at protests get arrested and beaten. And I think this separation is really problematic for a lot of ways, in a lot of ways. And um, I mean, it's a big problem, I think, this kind of analysis. But the other thing I wanted to just say is let's not, uh, like, I remember there was, uh, I think in Yemen during the protest, and you know, there was an uprising in Yemen. We should remember that. There was an uprising. Bahrain today is uh, a war. I mean, we have to consistently think, like, you know, what happened in Yemen? If something happened, then it was going away. Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf states invaded Bahrain basically and put it down and then went back over their one bridge back into their country. I mean, we have to keep. You know, it's not only Egypt, Syria, which are the ones, or Libya, which these are the most fantastic ones that we can sort of have a narrative about. Um, but in Yemen, there was, um, at, a, at a protest, there were women who were burning their hijabs, okay? Now, in the United States context, when you see such an image, people are like, oh, this is like bra burning. This is like the burning liberation, they're burning this like symbol of oppression, they're, and nobody bothered to ask, what do they mean by this action? And what they meant, these particular group of women, and I'm not saying this is what all Yemeni women, all Muslim women, blah, 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 I'm saying this particular woman in this particular protest were burning their hijabs to demonstrate how their honor had been violated by the regime. So it was actually a symbol of like, look, you've taken all my honor, I can't even wear my hijab anymore. Now, until we can start to understand the plurality of the way that people live their bodies and the way that people experience things like an item, mean, you know. So, in the United States, you look at this, you immediately think, oh, they're burning away patriarchy. That's what they're doing. They're liberating themselves and they can finally see the sun. Well, we always think it's always, all about, their hair. It's always about us. Yeah, right. Like... And that's not what they were doing at all. So until you can meet people and actually ask what they mean by particular actions, I think the question of gender and the question of women is always going to be wrapped up in what we think people want. And it's always going to be a question of, Gajri Spivak said this 30 years ago, saving brown women, white men saving brown women from brown men. We saw it in Afghanistan, we saw part of it in Iraq. I think we're done with it, we should be done with it. Um, I just wanted to add that, I mean, part, I mean, yes, we are concerned with women, of course we're concerned with what's happening, of course we're considered, with, with, like, we should be considered, we should be concerned with gender violence because it is a form of political violence that is something that we are concerned with. But I personally, and I teach on gender and I write about gender a lot, I'm always extremely, like, it almost makes me laugh when people who in no way, shape, or form could be considered feminists in, in the United States are suddenly feminists when it comes to the Middle East. And whenever you hear this, you have to really take a step and just, you know what's happening. If somebody who's not, you know, I mean, no examples. <laughs> Wait. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. So, okay, David. First, the United States gives many billions of dollars a year to the Egyptian military. And I'm wondering, in light of the coup, whether there's any sense that any of you have 
that that may be able, that there may actually be some opposition to that that may be useful and something that we in Brooklyn might want to participate in. My second question is more generally, um, there's an association with uh, U.S. intelligence activities um, and drug running. Um, and I'm wondering if that is in fact going on in places like Syria and Lebanon at this point um, as a way of funding some of the groups that the United States would like to see funded. So I'll listen to the answers. I, all I know is that, I mean, we're all trying to figure out. I mean, yeah, drug running has been, uh, and drug smuggling, and this, the drug the narcotics industry is a huge part of the economy in Lebanon. And um, I mean, there are even, there's even a campaign to nation, to legalize um, hashish, the, the growth and production of hashish, and then tax it, because it's probably the one sort of um, natural, uh, whatever, like resource that Lebanon <laughs> has. Um, and, I mean, I, but there's actually a really great book for anyone who's interested um, in looking at this further called The Lebanese Connection, which is actually a reconstruction of the 58 Civil War and the 75 Civil War through the drug trade. And it goes across, I mean, and then the borders that become important are Syria, but also Israel. And there is a strong drug smuggling um, across that border. Um, so I would just point you, to, I guess, to that book if you're interested really in looking at that stuff. And it's a really wonderful book written by a journalist. And it's worth mm -hmm. noting that there hasn't been really any aid to um, aid the, the humanitarian aid that the United States so The United States hasn't really stepped up to the humanitarian crisis that's happening. Uh, although they were happy to bomb, but they're not happy to get to actually help you know, the three million plus refugees. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. My sister is actually um, the director of a, of the only outpatient um, addictions clinic in the Middle East, in Lebanon. And she was saying that after what she's been seeing in Lebanon and Syria, is that, I mean, for those of you that don't know, Syria has a pretty strong pharmaceutical industry and had a pretty strong pharmaceutical industry. Really, it was Syria and Egypt and Saudi Arabia have the farms in the Middle East. And what's happened is that um, because of the destruction of these facilities and the sort of lack of, I mean, that there's increasing reports of not the <coughs> drugs that we would that we think, but actually like um, <coughs> pharmaceutical drugs. There's a captagon. I don't know if anyone has heard this word, but it's all you hear in Lebanon and Syria. Captagon. Um, it's an amphetamine, and we really shouldn't be surprised that long drawn out warfare, civil warfare, that a lot of the fighters are on are taking drugs. We, this shouldn't surprise us at all. If we look at American history, if we look at, I mean, I remember even being a kid, grow, walking around in Beirut in the 80s, and you would like be stepping on the vials of cook, uh, that people would use that are drug vials, right, or syringe, whatever, because that's also a part of war that we, that is, so I think we're oh, just about out of time. So um, I guess we'll say thank you to our panelists. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you to the audience for coming out. And also thank you for working peace again to Park Slope United Methodist for letting I'm sorry, Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church will let you see this space. Thank you.